get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars. Uh, if you listen to that interview, he talks about how and before they actually sold to Kellogg for $600 million, check out how he built it up. Um, P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he, he made money as a street mime. So before, you know, he drove cross country, Wanda, and he basically put his hat on the street and did street mime to make apartment money and food money before selling hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X products. Um, and many, many more um, stories. Nolan Bushnell was an interesting one, uh, founder of Atari. He was Steve Jobs' mentor. Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000, and he talks about why he said no to that. Can you imagine that? Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded <laughs> with my business partner, John Corcoran. Our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. We do that through our, our Done For You services, a complete Done For You podcast solution, which in my opinion is the best um, thing I've done for my business in my life. And um, I've connected with my business partner, referral partners, strategic partners, clients. I've made best friends um, doing the podcast. And we make it so business can show up and talk. And then we do everything else, put it across iTunes, Spotify, everywhere it needs to go. Um, but we do have a greater purpose, you know, just like you, Wanda, which we'll talk about. Uh, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor and he escaped Nazi Germany. And him and his brother were the only people to survive from their entire family. While that was happening, um, John, my business partner's grandfather, was a B-17 captain and pilot who flew 35 missions over Nazi Germany in world, during World War II. So um, we honor our grandfather's legacy with a scholarship. Um, it's rise25.com slash mission. And if you know of a veteran entrepreneur, um, then have them that to them to apply. And basically what it is, any events that we do, any VIP events, we do at a conference. We go to a lot of conferences. We will, sometimes it's an all expense paid trip, ticket, hotel, tickets to the conference um, to just level up their business. So if you know of a veteran entrepreneur, send them to rise25.com slash mission. Um, I'm excited for today's guest. Um, today we have Wanda James, CEO and co-founder of Simply Pure Dispensary. Uh, their co-founder with her husband, actually. So I'd love to hear. We'll talk about how that works as far as relationship goes. <laughs> and you're laughing. <laughs> He's a master cannabis chef, Scott Dura. Yeah. And um, yeah. Simply Pure is one of Colorado's most recognized dispensaries. It was one of the first dispensaries in 2009. And if you know anything about, you know, Colorado is the cutting edge of the cannabis industry. And they were the first African Americans licensed in Colorado to own a dispensary and edible company. Um, she's also president of the Cannabis Global Initiative, which is dedicated to assisting with the sustained growth, regulation, development of the cannabis industry. And uh, she was named one of the 100 most influential people in cannabis by High Times Magazine. They've been featured all over the place, uh, national, international, uh, BBC, The Atlantic, MSNBC, The Daily Show, John Stewart, many more. Um, check out their, you know, you can find their uh, website, simplypure.com. Wanda, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on this great morning. You know, it's really interesting. And um, there's a deeper piece to this for you. It's not just making money with cannabis. It's not even just the medicinal properties and the, and the, the great properties it has for, for people and their health. Um, it's a, really a deeper meaning for you. Um, and I totally you know, relate to that with my grandfather. I feel like you have this, you have this, you know, fire in your belly because of um, your brother and other social justice and equity pieces. So I wonder if you would start by just telling the story of what happened with your brother. Sure. Good morning, Chicago. And thank you for having me on this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing where we're at in America right now when we think about uh, cannabis and cannabis entrepreneurism. And what we have seen uh, for the last hundred years um, is cannabis has been used as a way to uh, 
further America's privatized prison system, which is furthering America's slave-based labor force. America has always had a slave labor force. We were built on actual slaves. Um, after the Reconstruction period, we then chose not to pay people for the work that they did, indentured servitude, sharecropping, and those types of things. We then started to bring in migrant workers from you know, Mexico and our southern region and pay less than minimum wage. If we all remember the starkest was sued back in, I think it was like the early 90s. So then we were no longer able to exploit migrant workers by not paying them, you know, a fair, uh, a fair wage. So America had to create a new slave labor force. And the way that they created this was by putting people in prisons and then giving contracts to prisons to be able to do the work for our corporate uh, Fortune 100 companies. So if you've bought flowers, uh, my husband gets mad at me when I name companies, so I won't name companies. But if, you, <laughs> if you've bought if you've bought flowers from the big store down the street from you that sells lumber and flowers <laughs> and plants, um, that store has slave labor farms. So what is slave labor? Slave labor means you can put somebody to work in all 50 states for anywhere between $12 a day or a dollar an hour. If you remember in California recently, they were very proud of the fact that they had prisoners on the fire line fighting fires for a dollar a day. So these are issues and they wanna tout it as, well, we're training people to do things and we're training people to get good jobs when they get out. The issue for that is, is if the fire departments, if the big box stores that sell flowers are getting their labor for a dollar a day, why would they hire the people on the outside for a fair wage? So this has been the problem with slave labor. And so the privatized prison systems took that to another level. And that level is not only do people invest in the failure of America and invest in these prisons, they also invest in the fact that these prisons get these billion dollar contracts and have free labor. So what do we want for free labor? We want strong, non-addicted, young people that can go to work. Because if you come into jail and we arrest you for methamphetamines or for meth, and you are detoxing and you have the shakes and you can't work, then you are really no use to my privatized prison system and my slave labor force. Right. So we don't want to arrest those folks. So we have targeted cannabis users, not only cannabis users, but we have targeted black and brown cannabis users. And we have that now for over a hundred years. Prior to legalization, 800,000 people a year were arrested for simple possession, not being dealers, not being Pablo Escobar, but simple possession. Right. My brother was one of those people. At 17 years old, my brother got caught with four ounces of cannabis. Four ounces um, back in the day, if for those that remember, was a baggie, a sandwich baggie, and four fingers would be considered a lid or, or $40 of weed. $30 a weed, $20 a weed, $10 a weed in a baggie. My brother and his friends decided to go out on a Friday night. They all put up their $40, gave it to my brother. My brother went into the weed guy's house, some four ounces. They gave him a little bit extra because he bought four ounces. Um, the house was under surveillance. My brother came out. He got popped. Mm. My brother, I didn't know my brother then. I was raised by a single parent father. And I had met my brother um, much later uh, as he was coming off of parole at my father's funeral. When I met him, the first thing he said to me was, sis, I just got out of prison. And my heart sank. Because if you go to prison, you killed somebody, right? You murdered somebody. You, you raped did somebody. You something very you, serious, right? You did something bad to go to prison for and get a 10-year sentence. Oh, my God. You did something horrible, right? When he told me four ounces of pot, I didn't believe him. Because in my zip code in Colorado, me and all my white friends sat on the steps of the University of Colorado in Libby Hall with a pound between us every Friday, rolling joints <laughs> for the weekend. CUPD would walk by and tell us to put it away. You know, kids, put that stuff away, put it away. We put it away, <laughs> cops took it away, we bring it back out, start rolling again, right? right? In my world, I've always known that cannabis was illegal. But I always felt like it was like a speeding thing. Yeah, you're not supposed to speed, but you know everybody speeds. So what's the problem? Nobody goes to jail for speeding, right? Um, none of my friends ever went to jail for marijuana, cannabis. Nobody. Never in my entire life until I met my brother. 
And when I saw my brother's case and he told me his story, he never saw an attorney, went right in front of the judge with his mother. They told her, you can take your son home today if you sign these papers. She signed the papers that made her son a felon. She didn't know what she was. It wasn't her mm. fault. She took her son home. Uh, 30 days later, he came back to meet with his probation or parole officer, and they gave him a drug test, and he failed. They immediately put him into a privatized prison. Uh, 18 years old, privatized prison, in with felons, uh, first offense. Uh, the next four years of my brother's life, every day, my brother was forced to pick 100 pounds of cotton wow. to buy his pizza. He was in jail for how long? Four years? Four years. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Four years. And every day he picked 100 pounds of cotton. So say that so America can hear me say this. A black boy was put into prison and picked 100 pounds of cotton every day to purchase his freedom. This wasn't 1865. This was 1990, 1992, 1993. To me, and you talk about the Holocaust, we talk about cruel and unusual punishment in America. Can you imagine a Jewish kid getting arrested and then being forced to clean gas chambers? Yeah. Because in our world, that's what that was like. To pick cotton, there's a mental piece to that, a mental issue with making a black kid in Texas pick. So this is where America has been at for cannabis. And when I found this out, I was pissed the fuck off. And I don't know any other way to put that except for with that word, because I was enraged enraged that America, that the country that I wore a uniform for, I'm a vet, I'm a military officer, naval officer. I wore, my father was uh, in the military. My grandfather was in the military. My great grandfather was in the military. And to find out that the blood of my family that is in the soil has now done this to my brother, I was enraged. So coming out of that, um, experience, we started to look at what we could to be able to shed light on the idea of the privatized prison systems and its ties to cannabis. Coming off of Barack Obama's National Finance Committee in 2008, we, or 2009, we knew that um, the uh, Ogden memo was coming out and that we were going to be able to work with our states to open up a dispensary. We opened up the first dispensary to be a this injustice that has been done in America. And that's what we've been doing for the last decade. We have been talking about injustice in America. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's a crazy story, right? So you probably wouldn't have even have found out, you know, found that out, you know, if it weren't for your brother and then like looking into it a little bit deeper, right? Because most people I would imagine don't even know that's going on. Most people have no idea that that is going on. Like I says, me and my friends for most of my life um, in smoking cannabis, we never really tried to hide it. I I mean, it was never because we never felt like it was wrong. Um, Interesting now to talk to younger people that grew up in New York and Chicago and Miami and L.A., um, their experiences were very different. Uh, cops busting on doors in their grandmother's house because they smelt marijuana or cannabis. Um, cops, you know, uh, harassing kids on the street, throwing their faces into, you know, into the on them. You know, these are the things that America did not see. And in 2009, when people talk about what was the cost of getting involved in this industry, it wasn't a financial cost. We really took our freedom in our own, it, it, took our freedom um, and put that on the line to be able to do what we do today. So this has been a big thing and a big part of our life. It's not just a job for us. It's what we do. It's our passion. It's our, it's our family business, not the cannabis, but speaking about um, social justice and righting this wrong. Yeah. Wanda, I want to talk about, you know, okay, 2009, you open the dispensary. What what happens after that? But I want to go back in time a little bit because you said a couple things. And I wanted to touch on, you know, single father, par- being raised single parent home, what that was like. And then I want to hear about some military lessons. Um, so back up to the single, you know, because that's, you know, someone's upbringing, you know, greatly influences what they end up doing, how they are. And so I'd love to hear, because you hear single parent home being mostly mothers, one, and a single parent home in general is, 
you know, can be difficult. Um, so talk about growing up in a single parent home with your father raising you. Um, truck was just going by. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, spectacular, amazing, fantastic. I was given, um, honestly, I was given the world's best dad. And I don't mean that from just speaking of just everybody's dad is the world's best dad, but my dad was something extremely special. Um, my father was a black Texas cowboy. He was six foot three, uh, always had on some cowboy hat, belt, boots. Hmm. Um, but he was a spectacular man. He fought for custody of me in 1972 when he won. And it was me and my dad for most of my life that I remember. I do have four brothers. Uh, my father remarried when I was 16, and I have two younger brothers. Uh, we fell Rick when I was uh, 35, right before my father passed away. Mm. And then I have an older brother from my parents' marriage. Um, but my dad and I are were are <laughs> extremely, extremely close. I mean, he was this amazing rock of this individual that taught me all about life and love and how to be tough. I mean, he raised a really tough, he raised a tough, tough human being. Um, and it's funny when I look back on my life, everything that has happened has prepared me for this moment. I mean, my father, I've been a sharpshooter. I was a sharpshooter in the military. I've mm -hmm. been shooting since I was 10 years old, which is always interesting for a woman to have that skill. But I was raised on a, on a farm and on a ranch. Um, you know, we had six acres and uh, owning a gun was, was, an, was a necessity um, for protection and for just because my dad was a tech cowboy. <laughs> we were just raised around guns. Um, so very different than an inner city type of a, of a, of a position. But my father was, um, he valued education. He valued, he valued people. We traveled the world. I mean, we met, we lived in Germany. We lived in England. Hmm. Um, it, it was just really an amazing upbringing. So it wasn't the type of single family or single parent household that I think a lot of people imagine when they think of a black kid being raised by a single parent. No, not rich. As a matter of fact, as my father put it, um, I called him when I was in college and I said, Dad, why do you tell me we were poor? Because I didn't know we were poor. And he says, because we weren't poor. We were broke. He says, broke is a financial condition. Poor is a mental condition. Hmm. So that was the how I was raised. I was raised with horses and dogs and, um, you know, I had chores. And I mean, it was really the all-American life that I was raised with. It was just with no parent. Were you put to work on the, on the ranch at a young age? Oh. Or what did you have to do? Of course. Yeah. I mean, I grew up with horses. I grew up riding. I, I rode Pikes Peak or Bus Rodeo. Um, I, I mean, oh, yeah, the chores with the horses. We had horses. We had chickens. <laughs> we had rabbits. Um, started with two, ended up with 70. Yeah, we had all kinds of mm. different animals you know, that we had to take care of. And, you know, being just my father and I in the 1970s, I mean, it was, you know, definitively a challenge. And when I look back on his life, I'm sure it was much harder on him. And you know, years later, when I talked to him about it, I said, you know, Dad, thank you for being an amazing dad. And he says, no. He goes, it wasn't thank you. He goes, I loved every minute of it. So mm -hmm. this was the amazing man that raised me. And honestly, the world's greatest father. Yeah. world's greatest father. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and then the military, what prompted you to make the decision to, to join? Because it's all you know. You know what I mean? It's funny, like, if your father and grandfather and great-grandfather were all lawyers there's a good chance that you're probably going to end up in the legal field, you know, and we come from a military family, which, um, you know, exemplifies the pride that we have in this country. And it exemplifies the ownership that I have in this country. This is my country, mine, <laughs> you know, my race was built on the shores of this country in 1619. And since then we have had a James family member in every war in American history. We've had Buffalo sold, my great, great grandfather, my grandfather, my father, you know, I mm. wore the uniform. So when I think about the soil in this country, my family's blood in this soil. My grandfather was a Southern Baptist minister in Yoakum, Texas, built the church, built the schools. I mean, this is the family that I come from. This is this great American, American family. So I become incensed when people attempt to take that away from me or attempt to make us second-class citizens or, God forbid, make my brother a slave. So you can still see the intensity of which I rejected um, 
this American value, this messed up American value, because I am America. And I feel that. I, and I feel that deeply. And I will not allow this country to disrespect those people that built it. Yeah, totally. Um, so that's so yeah. why I joined the military. So in college, uh, uh, ROTC, my father wanted me to go to the uh, Air Force Academy. I wasn't going to do that. Because you went to um, Boulder, right, for college? University, University yeah. of Colorado in Boulder, and I was Naval ROTC, um, you know, there. And, you know, it, it was an amazing experience. You know, it was uh, one of those experiences, especially for a young woman, that takes the word can't out of your vocabulary. Um, it teaches you how to compete. It teaches you how to be mentally strong, how to be mentally focused. Um, you know, I loved every minute of it. Didn't love being in the military as much, but... Um, <laughs> I, I absolutely loved um, all of the qualities that it afforded me to have. Yeah. So, 2009, tell me mm -hmm. the beginning of the journey of, I mean, this is in dog years, like 100 years, right, as far as dispensaries <laughs> yeah. go. It's like yeah, the beginning exactly. of the internet, sort of. Like right exactly. now, it's, it's exactly you know, things it. get hot and exciting and popular, like, 10 to 20 years after the pioneers kind of start, you know, so I, I imagine at that point it was not easy. Like now it seems, oh yeah, it's an obvious choice to have a dispensary, right? The, the laws are changing, at least in Illinois right now, it's supposed to change in next year. Um, and so we it seems- We want to play in Illinois too. What's that? So hashtag, says we want to play in Illinois too. Okay. So hashtag Illinois. <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> So I imagine at that time, it seems obvious now, but then not so obvious. What was it like? Start, you know, tell me a little about the journey in 2009 when you started. So outside of the serious, serious stuff that we did, you know, around race relations, it was really because, you know, people think that our journey in being in the press started 10 years ago. But Scott and I have always been in the press. Um, we've been in the press for our restaurants. We've been in the press for a lot of the work that we did. So um, about a week before we opened up the dispensary, one of the writers for the Denver Post was in our downtown restaurant. And uh, I went over to him and I said, hey, Bill, I got a story for you. And he was like, what's well, the story? Guys, you guys opened up another restaurant? And I said, no. He's like, oh, wow, you're expanding outside of Colorado. I says, no. He's like, what's the story? And I'm like, eat your food. And I'll tell you guys when you come back for dessert. And as I kept walking past this table, he's like, what's the story? What's the story? And when I sat down with him and I says, um, we're opening up a dispensary next week. He literally put his food down and he says, are you kidding me? He goes, you're going to destroy your career. Why would you do this? Mm. And he wrote a piece on us called coming out of the can closet. And I found it really funny um, as we came out, came out. Um, and I'd been working in politics. Uh, I, I 25 years in politics, as a matter of fact. So I, I ran Congressman Jared Polis's campaign in 2007 and 2008. He is now the governor of Colorado. I was on Barack Obama's National Finance Committee. I had run three or four congressional races, my own congressional race in, in Los Angeles years before. And this Denver Post reporter just could not believe that we were going to throw away mm. a reputation on opening up um, a dispensary. Um, we got lots of phone calls when we opened from lots of politicians telling me the same thing, that you have just destroyed your career. No politician will go anywhere near you. You know, you will not be taken seriously. You know, you've just the whole world, you know, about your drug use, which I found kind of funny because I graduated from the University of Colorado, which is the number one pot smoking college in America, or at least it has been since 1962. I, my husband and I had three Caribbean restaurants. We were in Jamaica all the time. And I'm kind of surprised I've never hidden my pot use i mean i don't walk around you know blazed and stoned but <laughs> like didn't you was, see the writing on the wall come on yeah, yeah i was really kind of surprised that people were were surprised that um we were cannabis users you know so because people just don't uh, talk about it they just don't talk about it right. you know uh but in my world and in my circle uh you, you walk into my house we hand you a joint 
I, I mean, it's like you walking may have like a line British out the mother. door if you if you say that. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, right, at this point. Um, but it's what we do. I mean, so that was the first, you know, reaction to folks. And then as people started hearing us talk about it, talking about it from a veteran standpoint, because we came out for cannabis and PTSD back in 2009 because mm. vets were asking for it. You know, young men were coming back with shrapnel in their bodies, missing their arms, and they were in pain. And they were like, I don't want this Oxycontin. I just, it, you know, I want cannabis and nobody will give That's this to me. That's a whole nother conversation, totally. Totally. Yeah, another. yeah, definitely. So when we started speaking about that, um, then all of a sudden people started to see the seriousness and it wasn't just the, you know, chin chongs, you know, I'm gonna get you stoned, dude, you, you know, routine. So we have done the last decade of educating people of about what this is. And it was the thing that was most surprising for me, quite frankly, is that the amount of people who consume cannabis the world didn't understand that number was that large. And I was surprised that people thought consuming cannabis was akin to doing LSD or acid or something like that, right? That's you the know? So that was the perception. So that's what was shocking for me, to be honest with you. And we spent a lot of time dispelling those um, you know, wrong thoughts on, on the plant. So what does security look like 2009 at your dispensary? And what I always just yeah. wonder, you have a lot of valuable merchandise. People, do they have to pay, in Colorado, do they have to pay with cash at this point or, yeah. So everybody's supposed to pay with cash. We, we can take debit cards and credit cards, but it, it's a gray area at best, but it, right. for the most part, cash, yes. So 2009, um, what do you have to do security and then what does that look like now? So every dispensary is very different, yeah. right? Um, I will say this. Um, Denver is a bitty and Denver definitely has its problems. It's not New York, Chicago or Los Angeles, right? And then the areas in which our dispensaries have been located – um, and especially our dispensary now, we're in an extremely high-end neighborhood. Average cost of condos and homes is $660,000. We're on a very busy corner. We have Williams and Graham, about 50 restaurant uh, and bar speakeasy in the United States across the street. Two other restaurants um, across the street from us. All I mean, it's a bustling, bustling area that we're in. So our security, I like to say, is like the um, Tiffany jewelry store security. Um, well, you one, can come in I know and... you're a sharpshooter, so like no one that should be on the wall. The owner is an owner actual is sharpshooter, sharp so if you try anything, <laughs> enter at your own risk. But, but anyways, besides that, you've got a good, a good hundred yards. I can pretty much take you out exactly. That, so. exactly. <laughs> Not going anywhere too fast. But there are no guns in my dispensary. There yeah. are no guns in the dispensary. So, so but when sorry. I say the, yeah. the, the the Tiffany. Um, because our dispensary is beautiful and it's important for me and for us to give you an experience when you walk in there that you're doing nothing wrong, right? So all of our security, and I don't mind talking about it because you can't come through it, the wall that puts us, that you get into the dispensary and you open the door is a concrete rebarb and force wall. You can't drive through it. With the correct equipment, it would take you 30 minutes to get through that wall. Mm. So... You know, you can break into the lobby and you can take my, you know, my beautiful pictures and my, you know, plaques and all that kind of good stuff, which would break my heart. But you're not getting into the dispensary. It's just not happening. Um, we have buttons, panic buttons all over the dispensary. So should anything go wrong, anybody in my dispensary within a matter of a second can alert um, police to showing up immediately. We do have armed response immediately. We do not have, you know, big burly guards with guns on them as you come into our dispensary because you're not doing anything wrong. And I don't want you to ever feel that way. When you walk in, I want you to feel the Tiffany experience. I want you focused on the diamonds and all the glittery stuff in there. I want you to walk in and feel happy and feel content. Um, I don't want you to ever think, oh my God, this is scary. I don't want that feeling ever in my dispensaries, ever, because the plant is not a scary plant. It's a loving, warm, inviting plant, right. and that's what we want. Um, talk about the the evolution of the products that you had. So when you started 2009 till today, I imagine, especially with your husband, you've been innovating. I watched some videos and he's kind of creating these different things. Um, what products did you have then? And what were some of the, maybe the items that, that stood the test of time and then today? 
So none of them have stood the test of time. Mm. Um, back in 2009, um, it was kind of funny. Uh, so the law in 2009 had not been created. So basically what happened is any cannabis product that was placed in my hands, the minute it was placed in my hands was now legal. That worked. It was illegal. <laughs> we would literally have people show <laughs> That was law. Literally, we would have people show up with the edibles that they made in their home. Oh, I've got koopy cups with two times dosage in them. I'm like, what's two times dosage? Just two times dosage. And they were chocolate gooey things. And, and so we went out during that time, or my husband went out, and he said, you know what? Our concern in the industry in 2009 wasn't that cannabis and the edibles was going to hurt you. It was that the edibles were going to hurt you because they weren't prepared in in commercial kitchens. They weren't prepared with food grade standards. They weren't, it, it just wasn't happening. So my husband pulled together a number of chefs in the area and started making um, all the edibles that we carried in the dispensary back then. And the dispensary, we took a whole corner of the dispensary and called it the gourmet shop because edibles became a quarter of our sales back in 19 or back in 19 back in 2009 because of the fact that we highlighted actual chefs all of the food was made in commercial kitchens we actually wrote the rules surrounding um, the production of edibles back in 2009 and 2010 so yeah so back then i mean you could come in with a bunt cake or a banana banana bread and you know we'd wrap it up and slap a label on it and and sell it you know? now clearly everything that you sell um these are the new incredible vegan gummies that just came out um they all have to be in a child proof container mm -hmm. they all have to have you know all the ingredients and warning labels on them they have to talk about that it's a thc on there it has to have the exact dosage so and in colorado um every serving can only be 10 milligrams um 100 milligrams max per bottle um, back in 2009, you know what you were eating. I mean, one cookie could have 500 <laughs> milligrams in it. You could right. days after one cookie. All I had was a cookie. <laughs> Three days has been gone. So we don't have that any longer, right? It's a highly regulated market. I mean, everything that we sell, even our cannabis, you know, has to show, you know, all of the growing techniques. Anything that we put into the cannabis has to be there. So those are the big changes at the now is now we are a very safe industry. We're a very regulated industry. Um, and the consumer can be can rest assured that if you have this gummy today, it will be the exact same gummy tomorrow or in the next day and the next day. So if a gummy in the morning helps you with your elbow pain, but doesn't make you high enough that you can't do your job, we want you to be able to do that every morning to know that you can take a gummy and go to work and be safe without getting there and find out that you have 400 milligrams and you can no longer see straight. Mm. So it's, it's really important um, where we've gotten with, with edibles right now, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see the edible market explode the way that it has. What are the most popular products now at Simply Pure? Oh. My goodness. So we have about 450 SKUs mm -hmm. um, in our dispensary. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is cannabis related as well. But, I mean, we have everything from from drinks that are iced tea, lemonade, the carbonated drinks. We have uh, one of the number one selling products that we carry is a um, infused sex lube um, for women. Um, it's geared for women and it's uh, an amazing product. We have gummies, we have chocolates done by one of a, a French trained Parisian chocolatier. We have, uh, you know, cookies, we have um, uh, patch topicals, uh, tinctures, sublinguals. I mean, anything that you, this is what I love about where we are in cannabis right now. When people come into our dispensary, we ask them, what is it that you want to experience? Mm. You know, are you going up to a bachelor party and bail with your girlfriends? Or are you having an issue just not being able to sleep at night? You know, I mean, there's... Depends and what the you, use case is. Depends what the use is. And we want you to have the best experience possible. What surprised you of what people use it for? Because I imagine you, you've heard every story under the sun from back pain to whatever what's maybe initially was there any initial shock value of um or just surprise of oh i didn't realize it could help that sex lube 
Like, how did you? And how did that product even come to be? That's, that's one of our number one selling products. It is. Um, what they have found with uh, <laughs> odd conversation to be having this morning. Um, I, you I knew mean, this was going to go somewhere weird. So yeah. <laughs> it was going to go somewhere weird. Um, you know, but the absorption in your genitalia is the same as the absor- absorption in your mouth. And what we find is using uh, an infused cannabis loops actually increases blood flow for a woman and increases her sensitivity. And so it is uh, designed for a woman um, and it is one of our top selling products. So that was probably the product that I did not see coming. Mm. <laughs> um, everything else, I mean, as edible started uh, to become more and more popular, clearly there is nothing that we can't infuse. And shameless plug, my husband, Scott Durad, just won the semifinals on Bon Appetit's uh, Chef Challenge wow. uh, about a month ago. He did win the finals, he came in second. But the idea now that top chefs, um, I love my husband's edibles that we make and we sell in the store that are regulated and packaged. However, more so, I love it when he cooks with cannabis. You know, he does a curried muscle, um, curried muscle or muscles in a, in a curry sauce that's infused. Fabulous. And so when you're eating dinner like that and you're experiencing it with your friends and, you yeah. know, you're you're talking for two and three hours and the cannabis kinds of sets in, those types of dinner parties are really special and a lot of fun. So, yeah, there, there's really nothing about cannabis that surprises me right now. Yeah. What you can do with it. Um, the discovery of products, like, for instance, for the sex loop, how did you discover that product and decide, okay, we, we're going to actually carry this? Because I bet you get a lot of people pitching you different different things. Yeah, we do. So Simply Pure, um, it's a special place. It's a very special dispensary. And we like to liken Simply Pure to like a Whole Foods market. So all of the products that we carry, industry, in the same way that we view the industry. They are social justice focused, they are quality focused. Um, And when I say quality, I do mean quality, that the testing is there, that the flavor is there. I even insist that the marketing is there because on our shelves, we and I come from a background in marketing, Fortune 100 background in marketing, so it has to look good, feel good, the way it all, all your products come together on the shelf and where you occupy the shelf in our dispensary. So when products come to us, we have a whole booklet Um, we call the VPP, which is the Vendor Participation Program. Um, We like to play with it like the OPP. We're like, who's down with VPP? (laughs) So if you're in our Uh. store, (laughs) you know me. (laughs) Um, So if you're in our store, you have to be down with VPP, um, which means that you help promote that your marketing, that your products, that you put work into what you do, that it's a whole... It's a whole. Someone has to have the whole package, again, you know, not just the from the product, part. but from the the look and feel, and also even their, um, you know, their mission, as well. Exactly. Simply is a curated experience for people because we are so many people's first dispensary. It is important to me that that experience is stellar. Yeah, yeah. Um, working with your husband. Talk about some of the good and some of the interesting dynamic between spouses working together. Well, 25 years later, he's still alive, so it's a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) You could shoot him down at 100 feet, no, 100 yards. Can't can't save husbands. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Uh, you know what? My husband and I have this amazing relationship. And, and once again, and I, I know this isn't the topic of what we're talking about today, but for all the young women out there listening and for all the men raising daughters, your daughter's relationship with her father will be the same relationship she has with every man in her life. In other words, if her relationship with her father is strong and trusting and he's a good man and shows her what a good man is all about, she will continually surround herself with good men that are trusting. And yeah, totally. my husband is an amazingly good man. And we have a phenomenal relationship, just like me and my father did. And he's one of my best friends. And it's not just cannabis that we have been in business together. Scott and I have been in business together now with five different uh, restaurants, a consulting business, uh, three dispensaries, an edible company. And 25 years later, we still work together. Now, 
is that always peaceful? No, hell no, of course not. I mean, nor should it be. <laughs> No, no, you know, I mean, that's as as Scott likes to say, he goes, that's what makes the chapters of the book more interesting, you know. So, yeah, you, you know, it's hard. It's definitely hard because we live together. We work together. And because we are friends, we share the same pool of friends. So um, it, it's very unique. I, I don't know that all couples could do this, but for 25 years, we've had an amazing friendship, relationship, marriage and business partnership. Yeah. Um. So, Wanda, you know. I'm sure you guys have different roles, obviously, um, in the company. And so I, I don't know if this is true, if he's more kind of a creative type. Uh, that's what I envision being a chef and like creating all these different infusions. And I'm curious what decisions you've disagreed on that um, you you fought it out in like a you know amicable way and you were right. And then what was a disagreement where you fought it out and he ended up being right? Because you you come from different vantage points, I I I'm, I feel. Um, interesting question, and I can't tell you that we have ever had it out on a disagreement as we need to do X or we need to do Y. Mm. That's never been the disagreement. The disagreement is should X be blue or should X be white? <laughs> you know what I mean? We've always read that we're going to do X, but then what does X feel and look like? So obviously in the creation of menus for our restaurants, right? Um, Scott is the creative type. So, you know, his menu could have, you know, if it was up to him, you know, 400 items on there, all beautifully done, <laughs> you know, um, Scott's the dreamer. Scott is the happy person in our relationship. Scott is the person that brings me loads of joy. Mm -hmm. I'm the taskmaster. I tend to be more serious. Um, and I got to be honest with you, if it wasn't for Scott in my life, my life would be very serious and without joy and without a lot of laughter. So I appreciate that Scott brings that to me. And I think my role is to be like, you know what, Scott, we can't do 450 items on the menu. Right. Yes, those are all wonderful. But pick your top 10. <laughs> um, so you balance each I, other I think, out. Like he reigns, you reign him in with maybe some creative stuff and he reigns you in with, you know, lighten up. Lighten up, have some fun and Got take it. a chance. And Scott's, I mean, we both take chances, but Scott's a visionary, you know? I mean, all of our restaurants were because of Scott. Uh, me being an entrepreneur was because Scott talked me into leaving corporate America, which, um, you know, I was military, I was corporate, I was going to be the CEO of a Fortune 100 company one day, or I mm. thought I was, mm. and now I see cannabis. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> which is much better, by the way, which is much, 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 much better than being the CEO <laughs> of a Fortune 100 company. <laughs> um, misconceptions of THC and CBD. I wonder if you could talk about, I mean, e even though there's more information out there, I feel like there's still a lot of misconceptions and people don't understand um, what would you tell people about some of the misconceptions about THC versus CBD versus, you know, what's out there? CBD by itself doesn't work. Um, number one, uh, perception, um, CBD by itself is an amazing vitamin. I'm sure it does great things. It opens up your blood flow, but if you're looking for a serious pain relief, if you're trying to treat, um, serious things such as MS, epilepsy, cancer. Uh, if you've got hardcore issues, health issues that you want to deal with, CBD only is not the answer. Um, CBD only works um, when you have a little bit of THC because THC is the key that unlocks the, the healing properties for CBD. Um, that's the biggest misconception that I think is going on right now. Uh, all CBD is not created equal. Uh, most of it out there is snake oil and not good for you. Mm -hmm. If you're buying your CBD from a gas station, stop. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, how do you tell? Yeah. That's, how do you tell? Yeah. How do you tell if the CBD is actually oh. good or it's just a snake oil company that just is trying you, to make money from the trend? Do you, do your research and then be very careful as well too. Here's the biggest problem with CBD. Um, CBD comes from hemp. If it's not derived properly, 
there may be traces of THC in it, which in my estimation is probably somewhat good for you. However, if you're a police officer that thinks they just bought a CBD only and you're taking that and you get tested, you might test for cannab- or test for THC. So you need to make very sure that before you take a CBD that you go online, that you research the company. Is the company a, uh, and you know, it, it's all right there. Start with their website. You know, what is their process um, uh, for, for their CBD or where are they getting it from? Have you seen their... Uh, uh, their testing, their lab testing, and every CBD company should have that on its website so that you can actually see that there is no THD in there, especially for people that are being tested for cannabis um, cannabis usage. Uh, you want to make sure that, once again, <laughs> if you're getting it cheap at your gas station, then you're getting it at your gas station, right? Think that through for a second. <laughs> right. Um, and if you have real issue that you're dealing with, cancer, MS, epilepsy, Parkinson's, um, Alzheimer's, if you're dealing with that and you want real relief, you absolutely need to sit down with a cannabis doctor that understands THC with CBD and how all of that is going to break down um, in your body and what it is that you need for those specific ailments that you are dealing with. Um, because there are doctors that are now dialing in to exactly what you need. There's a $10 million study going on right now at the University of Colorado for childhood epilepsy, and they're dialing in to what exactly um, these children need and how they need it. Hmm. So be smart. It's like everything else that you put in your body. Be smart. And then the THC side of things, the misconceptions of all THC gets you high, et cetera. What you know, what are some of the misconceptions that we should dispel about THC? So here's the amazing thing about the plant and that we're learning, right, is that there are, you know, maybe up to 600, or, uh, 60 cannabinoids, maybe 600 cannabinoids in, t- in, the, in the plant. THC and CBD are just two of them, right? So the thing to understand about THC is um, how you feel on THC or different types of THC probably has more to do with the terpenes than it does with the THC. So obviously somebody will say sometimes, every time I smoke, I get really jittery, you know, and I get really paranoid. Um, It's because we had thought before that you have ingested too much of a sativa brand, which is making you feel up. Um, It's good for people that are depressed, obviously, but for folks that are already hyperactive, it may make you feel very jittery and very paranoid. Um, Or it might be the lemonine terpene that does that to you, right? So we are learning so much about this plant right now. And what is a terpene? Um, You ever smelled a rose? What you smell in a rose, that's a rose terpene, Hmm. all right? So a lemonine terpene is what you see is a a citrusy side that you see in um, cannabis, such as um, a tangerine strain or a a lemon haze or something like that. You'll you'll get that um, citrusy type of uh, feel. I'm bringing up lemonine terpene because lemonine makes me feel very joyous. It makes me feel very happy inside. Hmm. So when we start to really get at breaking down this plant and what it does, we're going to be amazed that we can dial in and target exactly how you want to feel Mm -hmm. with the cannabis plant. You want to feel energy, we can do that. You want to feel relaxed but not tired, we can do that. You want to get knocked out because you can't sleep, we can do that. So this is the amazing things, the science behind this plant is fascinating to me. Yeah. Wanda, what's uh, on tap for the future? Uh, Future of Simply Pure, um, you know, you have your finger on the pulse and some of the cutting edge stuff since you've been in it so long. What's the future of Simply Pure? And then maybe, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about the Cannabis Global Initiative and, and maybe they combine, maybe not. Sure. But what's sure. what's the fu- in store for the future? So what's in store for the future is Simply Pure is now getting ready to um, expand out of Colorado. So we look forward to maybe being in Illinois, maybe being in Boston or Massachusetts, maybe being in California. So we look forward to growing the company. Um, I look forward uh, in the very near future to stepping down as CEO and finding somebody younger, brighter, faster, smarter um, to take over this position. And for me, once the company is in, in strong growth mode, I really look forward to 
um, putting my work into the Cannabis Global Initiative, CGI. We just launched the Cannabis Equity Initiative um, in which we're going to be working with companies to be able to increase and have them understand why it's important to increase equity in this industry. Mm -hmm. So my question to big companies is not how many budologists or bud tenders that you have hired that happen to be black, brown, Latino, or women. Um, what does your board look like? What does your C-suite look like? You know, what is it? How are you actually talking about equity amongst um, your company and why is that important? So this is where we need to get because we can't continue to leave people of color out of this industry. We can't leave women out of this industry. So the Cannabis Equity Initiative, um, along with uh, the Cannabis Global Initiative, is something that I look forward to spearheading and to growing, uh, you know, uh, as I move out of a CEO role more into uh, uh, an information and you know speaking kind of a, a of a of a role yeah. is what I'm really looking forward to. One, uh, first of all, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been fantastic. Everyone should check out simplypure.com. Check out what they have going on. Where else should we point people towards, or is that the best place online? Simply Pure is great, and you can always find Wanda L. James um, on Instagram, Wanda James on Facebook, Wanda L. James on Twitter. <laughs> Awesome. Check out simplypure.com and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this and uh, good morning, Illinois. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.